Hi, everybody. Welcome to another special interest episode of 10 Words or Less, in which I ask brief questions of interesting people and ask them to re respond with brief answers of their own. I'm Michael Prager. I'm a professional speaker, a certified wellness coach, and the author of two books. My goals for this interview series are simple. I want to be interesting, usually on topics related to my professional pursuits. This interview has a additional goal, however, to help introduce my guest to my fellow members of the New England chapter of the New England Speaker, uh, excuse me, the National Speaker Association. If you're paying attention, you see that's NSA and E. And as I like to say, we took the I out of insane. Mike Robertson will be the featured speaker at the chapter's monthly gathering October 15th. And anyone can come member or not. So finally, about Mike. He'll be interesting for sure. No pressure, Mike. He's also a professional speaker, as well as the author of at least four books that I know of. He's deeply invested in creativity, and one of his outlets and speaking topics is how to make presentation slides that don't suck. Undoubtedly, anyone who has ever used slides would benefit from his help. I know I can. Finally, my usual admonishment to those of you playing at home. 10 words is a goal, not a limit. So please, no counting. I don't know why lately, Mike, I've started to shout that. Anyway, it's not so easy to do, which is why I like being on this side of the questions rather than being asked them. So Mike, I, I usually start in the same place. Please spell your first and last names as you would like them to appear in print. M-I-K-E. R-O-B-E-R-T-S-O-N. Thank you. Born when and where? Please be specific. I was born February 23rd, 1954 in a tiny town in the brush country of Texas called Catula, C-O-T-U-L-L-A. I don't think I have been back to Catula since I was born there. I was only born there to be close to my mother. <laughs> is that how it's going to be? Mike? Yeah, that's how it's going to be. <laughs> okay. Uh, tell me, was there anything unusual about the circumstances of your birth? No, I'm a middle child. So, of course, I'm, I'm starved for affection and love and attention. And that's why I'm in the speaking business, I suppose. I get it. The best answer I ever got to that question, it's why I ask it routinely now, is someone, uh, Kari Hammerschlag, a very... Uh, authoritative voice in food uh, policy said that uh, she was born in 1963 and she said her uh, mom's doctor's previous patient was Jackie O after the assassination. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So beat that. All right. Where do you live now? I live in Austin, Texas, the capital city, the weirdest city in Texas. Keep Austin weird. I've seen the slogan. I don't know exactly what it means, but I can guess. Austin's not your typical Texas town. And I will remain mute at this point. Tell me what you do for work. I speak. I'm a full-time speaker and designer of slides for myself and other people. All righty. Short here, Michael. Uh, I'm sorry. Say that again. I'm please. trying to give short answers here, and, and I feel like I'm not giving you enough, but. Uh, okay, uh, I appreciate your concern. I definitely acknowledge it. And uh, in the nicest, most respectful way I can, let me worry about that, okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, what was your first computer? My first computer was a Mac SE in 1987. It was a life-changing purchase. It literally changed my life having a computer in the house. I didn't know at the time what I was going to do with it, what its possibilities were. I just knew when I saw it in the store and the guy turned it on and it said, hello, welcome to Macintosh. I was charmed. Excellent. Uh, that's a pretty radical choice for a first computer. I'm not saying you did it or you did it alone, but uh, Macs were far less ubiquitous then. How did that come about? All I knew about computers was that they had a black screen with a little blinking green cursor on them. Every computer I'd ever seen was like that. And I was in this store and the guy said, look at this. And he turned it on and it had a 
pure white screen and a little happy face that said hello and uh, yeah. he showed me Mac paint he said look you can take this tool and draw a circle like this and then you click on this little paint bucket and you can fill that circle with a checkerboard pattern and I said I'm I'm sold I'll take <laughs> it I didn't buy a hard drive though that Mac had no internal hard drive at all and I thought I don't need a hard drive so for three days I was swapping diskettes every 30 seconds and uh, finally went back and paid $200 for a massive massive 20 megabyte hard drive and thought I'll never fill that up yeah <laughs> yeah I'm still operating on the theory that uh, you have to buy as much memory as you possibly can, can afford and then it's not enough and when you go back to get the next one it's cheaper than it was. yes okay tell me what did you create the first time you remember being creative the first time I remember being creative was probably making up a song uh, I am a musician I've written a lot of songs and so it was probably sitting on the swing set in my backyard making up a song as I I was swinging back and forth Excellent. I've always been into creative arts, uh, drawing, writing, acting, singing, playing music, and eventually, eventually, all that creativity ended up on the screen when I speak. Uh, tell me something important about being creative. You have to exercise it. You can't, well, you can, but it's not a good idea to be creative and then stop for a while because that muscle will begin to lose its strength. Uh, so it's a thing that you really have to exercise regularly and try out in different directions and try some different things. Last year I decided I would do something different creatively each month. So the first month of the year I wrote a song, complete all the tracks, recorded it. The second month I decided I would like to paint a large size painting, which I had never done. And uh, the third month, I published a, a new book. And after about three months, that's when my resolution came to a stop. <laughs> I was wondering, A, wow, he really did one every month. And B, how is he going to come up with 12 things? But I see how you did it now. Yeah, you I did it like everybody does their New Year's resolutions. <laughs> three months well, is actually pretty long compared to most resolutions. That's right. That's right. Uh, tell me a misunderstood part of creativity. One of the things I talk about in my keynote on creativity is that people tend to think they need a different gift to achieve something really cool. And so we become envious of other people's gifts. We say, well, if I could sing like that guy or if I had her acting ability, I could do something really great with my life. But we each have tools already the the trick is just finding a new way to use those tools and uh in in my speech i talk about the the skill drill and thrill aspect of using your gift everybody's got one you gotta identify what it is polish it up so it's at its peak performance and then find a new way to use it that nobody's used before and boy life gets very interesting and exciting when you do that what was your first career my first career was uh, working in small churches as a music and youth director, which meant I would lead the, the hymns and the choir on Sunday morning, and then I would plan activities for the teenagers on Sunday night and weekends and go to camp with them and things like that. Believe it or not, it's possible to get tired of working with teenagers. I, I, I take your point. I've never had to... Exp uh get to my breaking point, but I see it often right around the corner. Why are so many slide decks boring or worse? I think it's because most people who use slides think of that blank slide as the equivalent of the old flip charts that we use in brainstorming sessions, those big cheap pulp paper things where every page is identical and they're cheap and, and you scribble on them and then at the end of the meeting you throw them away. That's how most people think of their slides. So they put about as much thought into them as they do what they're gonna write on the brainstorming session page. And it's no wonder they don't have any impact. I think instead, I like to think of that screen, that white screen as a blank canvas. 
and myself as the artist who's responsible for painting something beautiful or lasting or that that carries a message all right you may have just answered it but i'd still like to ask what's a key goal for the visual part of your presentations well the key goal is always to keep the audience entranced enthralled it's it's a terrible losing battle when you realize you've lost everyone to their their iPhones and they're checking their email and Facebook and Twitter and things like that. Uh, instead, I want them, and I often get this, I want them to gasp at some of the things I put on the screen. I want them to be surprised. I want them to go, ooh, because I, I literally do some magical things on the screen. Wow. Okay, uh, tell me, tell us all, please, a Mike Robertson style tip for slides. One very simple one is use the whole picture, use the whole frame. I'm so tired of people who will put a picture of somebody they're quoting, and it's a little picture in a little tiny box on the screen. You have a lot of real estate there. You don't see a billboard on the highway with a tiny little picture in one corner of it. You got real estate to work with, so use it. We we respond well to images, and if you're going to use an image, use it the biggest you can possibly make it on your screen. Reduce the amount of words you use. Now, those are the kind of things you hear from everybody who's a quote expert in PowerPoint or slide design: more images, fewer words. But there's so much more. Those these programs are so powerful, and uh, and can be used to bring wonder or awe. You can make an audience cry with a slide. You can make an audience laugh with a slide. A slide can be the set for the play you want to do in front of it. The possibilities are limitless. Tell me, you speak, you design, and you write, and I'm sure you do many other things. But of those three, which came first? I... I was speaking even in high school. I did competitive speaking in high school and did very well at it. And then it just kind of went into the background. But in various jobs I've had over the years, I've had opportunity to speak. And I always loved hearing people speak, especially when they were good storytellers, good communicators. And I always thought that would be an interesting way to make a living. Uh, but I have written almost as long as I have spoken. I, I just uh, didn't have a channel for it for a long time but I've done four books now. That's satisfying, but hard to make yourself sit down and do. Speaking is kind of the unification to me of all the things I was interested in, from magic as a child, to music and performance as a teenager, to writing as an adult, and to my 20 years experience as a graphic designer. That all comes together now in, uh, in what I do and what I put on the screen. If one of those three, three had to go, which would go first? Probably the writing. That's the one that is hardest to make me sit down and do. I have more ideas for books in my head than I will ever get around to writing. I have to kind of set myself a quota system and say, I've got to do three pages and a day, and then I can stop. But as yet, I have not gotten back to that recently. Why do you speak? For me, it is a compulsion, Michael. I can't not speak. I've had, and I don't know where it came from, but I've had since I was a child, I've had the urge to perform in front of other people. And it has taken all these different forms of magic and music and drama and speaking. And speaking is the one that I find the most gratifying. You know, when I played music, people will come up and say, I liked your song or I liked, I liked your set. But it's very rare that somebody says, you know, that song you wrote changed my life. But that happens when you're a speaker. You have people come up and say, you really, you've given me some light. You've turned on a whole new way for me to live. And that's a pretty amazing thing to happen. And it's just a, a great way to, as I said, being a middle child, it's a great way to get attention. You're standing there in front of hundreds of people. And in many cases, they want to hear you and they will applaud for you. And sometimes they will even throw money at you. And that's not to <laughs> like about that. Yes. Um, if you want, I could be your money catcher. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, here's one of the money questions. 
can you name three and I'll give you ten words each for three things that uh, NSANE members will learn if they come to see you speak first they will learn some of the amazing potential that the program on their computer has that they have never tapped into second they will learn even if they've never used slides before, they will see ways in which slides could make them a better speaker with a better speech. And in third, I will show them dozens of specific elements of a slide, each of which can be tweaked and customized and improved. And even if they only learn one, their slides are gonna be much better than most people's. So it's gonna be a mind blowing experience. There, there's so much stuff that people come out of this session just going, oh my gosh, I had no idea that you could do that kind of stuff with slides. Now our members know that you're willing to look at some of their slides and take a different approach that you could suggest for each person who does that. I've already got a couple of submissions. Uh, can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I've done that with a couple of chapters and it's been very, very well received. And if I get them in advance, uh, I may even have time to actually do a makeover on them and show the before and after as part of that presentation to the chapter. That's very cool. I, I will show a lot of before and after examples anyway from other clients I've had because everybody will look at the screen and say, oh, I've got one that looks just like that. What should I do? And then I'll show them, here's, here's what you can do with a slide like that. But yeah, I would love to see people who have problem slides or slides they don't know what to do with yeah, please send them to me and we'll uh, take a look and give you some some rays of hope. Well, I appreciate that. I, I got to say for myself, now I, I, please don't hear this as my slides are really good. I don't need any help because that's that I could better every single slide I've ever made could be better. But I don't know when I think, well, which one should I give them? What 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 about this needs to be better? Uh, I know it's somewhat similar to what the Supreme Court said with, uh, maybe it was Douglas, Supreme, uh, the Justice Douglas, who said, uh, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. Right. And uh, once I see what you've done, I can say, oh yeah, but I don't know which of mine are most in need of, uh, of help. Do you, do you have any guidelines for how we could choose the one that uh, we'd like you to if there's to. one that you kind of dread coming to in your speech or if you like uh, if you're thinking oh no i know they're going to tune out when i get this one or if it's a slide that's just a wall of text or or 15 bullet points if you go to slide like that that's the kind that desperately needs some attention it's i don't have any of those it must just be perfect that's awesome okay I <laughs> still learn something. Do you use PowerPoint or Keynote? I started since I bought a Mac in 1987. I've been a Mac guy ever since. And so when I started using slides in my presentation, which has only been a few years ago, I was exclusively Keynote. And the first time I started talking about how to make better slides, people would say, well, how do you do that in PowerPoint? And I would say, I don't know. Or they would say, can I just hire you to do my slides? And I would say, do you use Keynote? And they would say, no, we have to use PowerPoint. And I'd say, can't help you. But finally, uh, after my presentation in Washington, D.C. at the convention there, I said, you know, I'm going to have to start doing PowerPoint also. So now I, I do both platforms. And of course, I have many more clients in PowerPoint than I do Keynote, just because PowerPoint is so ubiquitous that everybody has it. And uh, I still think Keynote is the better, more I elegant, more precise program, but but I'm fine with working in PowerPoint if that's what the client needs. I was at that presentation in Washington. Uh, I will tell you my little Keynote horror story. I'm the same way. I've always owned Macs. I've never owned a PC. A PC. Uh, only once was I assigned a PC. Well, that's not true. Uh, never mind that part. Uh, and then I went to Israel to do a TEDx talk. And a couple of weeks ahead of time, I started raising my concern about how we were going to be able, how I was going to be able to use my slides. And despite their assurances that we'll take care of it at this point and at this juncture and at this juncture, 
I was scheduled to go on second in the first half of the show, and they postponed that until after the break. And then I was second in the second half and finally had to go and said, okay, I'm not going to have any slides. And eventually the guy figured it out, the tech guy, which I thought was very impressive, three minutes into my speech, and I did, did end up having my slides. But they, the exclusivity of Apple's distribution means there's one distributor in the entire country, and people don't use Apple. Yeah. And I, you know, you talk about uh, uh, cultural differences. I didn't see that one coming, and that made a material difference in my presentation. Yeah. So, and I've been saying since, yeah, I got to get a, I got to get onto PowerPoint because that's what people use. And uh, unlike you, I'm just saying it so far. So, um, I think I read that you lost 75 pounds. How come you wanted to do that? Because I have, that's a battle I've been fighting my entire life, and I've gone up and down and up and down. And, and when I was, when I came up with the formula I mentioned earlier, the skill drill thrill thing, I thought, I wonder if there's a creative way to lose weight. Because we know that diets work. Every diet works if you stick with it. The problem is, how long can you stick with it if you only eat three things every day? Or and There's a problem with sticking with it. And, and so I thought, I wonder if I can do this in some creative way. And the, the way that I came up with that enabled me to lose 75 pounds was to say, all right, I'm not doing this for me. Because people say, you got to do it for yourself. I do everything for myself. My whole life is lived for myself, basically. That's, that's turned me into what I am. And so losing weight for myself doesn't have a lot of appeal for me. But I thought, what if I could do it for the story? What if I could do it as a part of a presentation and say, you know, I'm, I'm this many years old, and yet I made this dramatic change in my life. That's a powerful point that I can use. And so uh, I did lose 75 pounds in about 11 months. And I wish I could say I had kept all 75 of those at bay but they have a way of sneaking under the door and attacking you in the night. And many of them have found their way back to me. But the principle is still the same. You can, you can do things for other reasons than just for yourself. You can do things because it makes a better story. And I believe we're writing our story every day. And the saddest thing is when the last 12 chapters of your life story are just blank or ditto or same as previous page. And so uh, the same reason that I quit my job in June and went full-time in the speaking business at the age of 62, it's not the wisest decision, but it certainly makes a better story. And that's what I'm about now is writing a great story. I got it. So let's see here. Something about you that surprises people. At one point, I was the world leading expert in Pez dispensers. <laughs> did that surprise you? Yes, it did. So why? I had always liked them. I remembered them from my childhood. And then when I was in college, my roommate and I were in a, a dime store and we saw some and we were like, oh, Pez. And so I just started buying them when I would see them. And after a while, I had a whole drawer full of them, but I didn't know anybody else that collected them. And, and it wasn't until years later that there were all these collector publications on the stands that were basically just page after page of classified ads. And I started finding a couple of other people who collected them. This was in the late 80s when do-it-yourself zines were a thing, you know, and everybody was making zines about punk rock or movies or whatever. And so I ended up starting a zine about Pez dispensers. Before long, I had over 400 subscribers paying me 20 bucks a year for this publication. And then people were calling me from all over the world to share with me discoveries, uh, media sites, Wall Street Journal, Canadian Broadcasting Radio, Playboy, People Magazine were calling me because they said, we have some questions about Pez, can you answer them? And I said, yeah. And, uh, 
and so it was pretty cool, but it got to be a little bit oppressive after a while. And so what I ended up doing was having a huge auction, selling off almost all of my Pez dispensers, and I used that money to open up my own graphic design business. Awesome. Tell me uh, about one or two of the ones you kept. Uh, the ones I kept mostly aren't worth anything, but one of the ones I had that was probably the biggest return on investment was one that I purchased for a quarter in a Woolco store. And uh, oh, I also organized the first national convention for Pez dispensers in Cleveland. And at that convention, I sold that 25 cent dispenser for $600. I don't know how many million percent return that is, $600 on 25 cent investment, but pretty darn good. I'll take that any day of the week. It's 2,400 times. At least. Yeah, me too. I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to do that too. Could you? Uh, never mind. Uh, something that surprises you about other people. I guess it took me a long time to learn that other people all have amazing stories, even if they don't necessarily realize it yet. I used to not be good at all at networking or talking to other people. I was very, uh, very standoffish in groups first NSA convention I went to, I hardly spoke during the three days I was there. I didn't know a soul there. But since then, I've realized everybody has a story and you can learn some great things from their stories. And so instead of me waiting for somebody to talk to me, I became much more comfortable at saying, well, what's your story? What's something amazing that happened to you? And it, it really opens up relationships and it's formed friendships. And it also showed me lots of other people have very engaging, enthralling stories that they could develop in their own speaking often that they don't even realize they have this gold mine they're sitting on great stories. Stories to me are the keynote to any successful speech. And, uh, and one of the things that I'm most attached to are, are a couple of books that I have because I wrote a weekly column for several years and you're forced to come up with something. It's like having a blog where you commit to write something every day or every every week or whatever. you got to mine your own life for those little nuggets when you can say, oh, here's something that's worth sharing and me finding a meaning to. And once you have those stories, they're so adaptable. I have all these stories and I have them preserved in book form now. So if I'm talking to a different group, I can think, okay, I need that story and that story and that story and just string them together like pearls on a, a necklace. And they're so valuable and so adaptable. I'm so delighted to have them. I would encourage everybody to, to write down your stories, every story you can think of that's yours, because nobody else can use that story. Hopefully. <laughs> Put your mind back. I should tell you, at the time I was walking on the beach and I saw this kid picking up starfish. Yeah, you just took that, the word, literally took the words from my mouth. Oh, oh, okay, that's not, that's not literal. We're actually, uh, half a continent away, but I was about to say something like that. All right. When you... Okay, tell me, is there anything else you want our members to know about your visit? I can confidently promise you, you have not seen slides like these before. I know that every time we, we have meetings and, and even in chapter meetings, it's not uncommon to bring in somebody who is a PowerPoint expert but most of what they share is what I said earlier, don't use bullet points and use more images. But there's so much more than that. Uh, PowerPoint and Keynote are just hugely powerful programs. It's like Photoshop. It will do so many things, but most of us only barely scratch the surface. And once you see some of what the potential is, you begin to get excited about what you can do. Because when you have great slides, it makes you a better speaker. It makes you more enthusiastic, even if it's a talk you've given dozens of times before. When you know you've got this slide coming up that's gonna make them drop their teeth and burst into applause, you can't wait to get to it. You get excited about your own topic. I, I would like some slides like that, I would. So my last question, tell us something that you wish everybody would just get right. I wish everybody would get right that slides are not cue cards. They are not for you to refer to, to 
decide where you are in your speech. You should never turn around and read your words off the screen. That's not what they're for. They're not cue cards. They're not flip charts. They are canvases for you to explore something beautiful that will enhance, not repeat your words, but that will enhance your words and make them more memorable and stick in people's heads longer. I got that, and I, I'm an adherent of that idea, but still, it's not okay to also use them as part of an outline? I don't think so. Uh, that's what the presenter view on your, your computer is for. If you need notes, they can be in the presenter view where you can see it in front of you, but the audience should never see it. They should never catch you sweating. They should never see you being less than brilliant. You want to be a superhero in front of that audience. And to do that, you can't say, well, okay, I'm going to refer to my notes here, or let me turn around and read the screen because I forgot where I was. Okay. I, I guess we're closer than I realized from your statement. Uh, I, I know about the presenter screen, and I use the notes area when I need to. Uh, I still think, well, I will be uh, in the front row hoping to learn from you. Good. So, um, uh, Mike Robertson will be in Boston, actually in uh, Waltham at the Embassy Suites Hotel, 9 a.m. on October 15th. We'll go until 2.30. He won't be speaking for all that time, but for much of it. And you don't have to be a member of NSA New England in order to attend. I'll put in the uh, blog post that accompanies this video information on how to, uh, how to come. And if you need help with your slides, and if you give presentations, you need help with your slides. This guy could help you. I'm, as I said, I've seen him present once, and I have no doubt that it's going to be a worthwhile event. Mike, thank you for your time. Uh, if you could stick around a little bit after I end the broadcast. And for everyone else, see you on the 15th.